jump right into things tonight if we can, and uh, I'm trying to be mindful of time here. We're going to begin at the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16, and uh, I've been doing this now, preaching for, I think, about 35 years, and uh, not often after 35 years do I kind of really battle um, in regards to a message or teaching, whatever the case might be. Over this particular message tonight, I probably changed the sermon three times today, and uh, just just really going through some battles and struggles with it, and refining what I want, what I know the Lord wants me to share tonight. And the battle wasn't so much what He wanted me to share, but the battle was really to be sure that I could communicate what the Lord was putting upon my heart so heavy. And uh, what I want to kind of do tonight is maybe kind of expose the devil a little bit. And some of his devices in regards to evangelism. Some things I believe that possibly the body of Christ in some areas has bought a bill of goods in regards to evangelism. <laughs> and um, so I'm very mindful of hoping to communicate this clearly tonight. Um, hoping to communicate what the Lord would put upon my heart and uh, do it in a clear way and precise way. One of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight, and, and I don't want you, and I want to introduce this real quickly. You're going to hear me speak about methods of evangelism. And I don't want you to think that any of the methods I'm referring to, I'm referring to them in a negative way because I'm not. So don't go from here thinking he don't believe in this, he don't believe in that, he don't believe in this. But what I'm a, a, attempting to accomplish, first and foremost, is to separate in our thinking the gospel and the methods. And it's very important to do that because by not doing that, I think, is one of the ways that the enemy has been able to kind of get the body of Christ in some ways to buy a bill of goods. Now, Romans 1.16 is where we're going to start. I, uh, I was thinking today, too, that, you know, we're really creatures of fads, aren't we? And I think even churches go through fads, Christians go through fads. If you don't know what I mean by a fad, just... Ask everybody how many diets they've been on in the last few years. <laughs> you know, we have the, the low-calorie diets and the little-fat diets and the low-carb diets. And, you know, every time somebody writes a new book and tells you a way to lose weight, we change that fat to that fat. And, and you know, then if somebody says, well, eat this way and you'll live a healthier life, then we change to that fat. And eat this way and, you know, the person I know ate this way and lived to be 105, well, we want to eat that diet then, don't we? I remember years ago they discovered some Russians. They were all supposedly over 100 years old. And, the secret of it, they ate yogurt. So everybody ate yogurt for a while. <laughs> you know, I mean, we go through all those kind of fads, and, and to a great degree, in some ways, the church has done that. I've been saved now for 40 years, and I've watched the church go through a lot of fads in regards to evangelism. Evangelism has always been something that my heart was, was focused on a great deal, and so I was one that kind of, in some ways, bounced from fad to fad to fad at times. When I first got saved, I mean, the big thing was that everybody had to go out door to door, knock on doors, and share the gospel. And if you didn't do that, then you weren't worth a nickel. So everybody was doing that. And then all of a sudden they decided, well, you know, that really doesn't work anymore. And so let's do this. Let's just, everybody should have home Bible studies. That works. So all of a sudden everybody wanted home Bible studies. And then somewhere along the line they said, you know what, I don't think that works so good anymore. We just need to have cell groups. And so all of a sudden everybody decided to start having cell groups. And all the churches decided to start having cell groups. Then you know, everybody started going on doing street ministry. I fully believe wholeheartedly in street ministry. If it wasn't for street ministry, I wouldn't be here. I got saved as a result of street preachers, so I fully believe in that. Amen? I'd never been in a church service in my life before I came to Christ, and probably never would have been. Then there, I remember for a while, and I went through this, and I we had to have tent meetings like they used to. So we did tent meetings, and you know, we did that, and praise God, that was good. And then they said, well, you know, we just need to have social activities, invite everybody over, have a cookout, and make friends with them, and then, you know, that'll work. And we did that for a while. You see, the problem is we can become paralyzed by trying to figure out, well, should we do this method, this method, this method, this method, or this method, or this method, what method should we do? Maybe this method works and maybe this method don't. And so what happens is the enemy comes in and he begins to lie to us. And he begins to say, well, that method doesn't work anymore. 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 And we begin to buy the fact that the methods don't work. And then we have a condition that I referred to as evangelism paralysis. 
We're sitting there on our hands, and we bought the bill of goods, but nothing works anymore. Romans 1.16. Can we get that up there real quick? I've kind of gotten used to that. <laughs> you see, the, the thing that I would like to share with you tonight, the power of God doesn't rest on any single one of those methods. Not a single one of them. The power of God does not rest upon a single one of those methods. That's right. Amen. The Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's right. For it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God rests upon the gospel, not upon the method. That's right. The power of God rests upon the gospel. Hear that closely because this has a lot to do with where we're going at. Not upon the method. The power of God wasn't because we went door to door. The power of God wasn't because we had Bible studies. The power of God wasn't because we had cell groups. The power of God wasn't because we had tent meetings. The power of God was inherently inside of the gospel itself. Right, and those methods were affected by the, as a way that we shared the gospel. If you knock door to door and you share the gospel on the power of the Holy Ghost, it's effective. If you stand on a street corner and share the gospel of Jesus Christ on the power of the Holy Ghost, it's effective. Yes. If you sit there in your home and have a cell group and share the gospel on the power of the Holy Ghost, it's effective. Amen. No matter what method you're using or what means you're using, if you are communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, I'll guarantee you that that is effective. Yes. Now stop and think for a moment. What years is Romans 1.16 true? Was that true in the 1800s? Was that true in the 1900s? Is that true in 2020? In yes. 2020 in Pekin, Illinois, the gospel is still the power of God unto Amen. salvation. Hallelujah. Now, is that true in what societies? Is that true? They say we're a post-Christian society. I don't know what that means because societies don't get saved. That's People right. do. Jesus. And so, but even if we were a post-Christian society, would the gospel still be the power of God unto salvation? Yes, it Does it matter who's president? No. no matter who's present, the, the gospel is still the power of God unto yes. salvation. Amen. Would it matter whether we were in a communist country? It wouldn't. Would it? The gospel is still the power of God unto yes. salvation. Amen. No matter what day we're in, there will never be a time when that scripture right there is yes. not true. There will yes. never be a society where that's not true. There will never be a, a season when that's not true. That word is God's word. It was true before the foundations of this earth. It will be true after this world is, 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 is done away with. There will never be a time in all of existence when that scripture is not true. That's right. Amen? Amen. So there's no way that I can come here and convince you tonight that that is not true. Right. As a believer, as somebody who has a, the knowledge of the Word of God, I cannot persuade you that that scripture is not true. So yes. if I was the enemy, there's no way I could convince you that the gospel is not effective. Mm. Right? Oh. I mean, we remember the parable of the sower? Yes. It goes forth and sows the seed, and, and some falls on the wayside, and some on stony ground, and some among thorns. Mm -hmm. Some falls on good ground. Yes, it does. Hallelujah. So if we're spreading the gospel, yes. some will fall yes. on good ground. Amen. Now, is that scripture true today? Yes. yes. Same as it was 100 years ago. Yes. Same as it was 200 years ago. Yes. Same as it is at any time, in any place, that word is still true. Amen. Amen. Right. The gospel is still the power of God unto salvation. Yes. So there's no way that, I could, that the devil could come and convince us otherwise, is there? There's no way. I mean, as God's children, if we got the Word of God inside of us, there is no way that the devil could convince us that the gospel is not the power of God right. unto salvation. Amen. So why does it seem that the body of Christ is kind of sitting on their hands? If we truly believe that the gospel is the power of God, why are we kind of in evangelism Paralysis. What has happened? How did the enemy sneak in? Yep. Now let me ask you this. What if I came in here tonight and I decided to share with you why maybe I say I, I, this is not true, I'm just playing part here, uh, that door-to-door -door evangelism is no longer effective. I can probably persuade you of that. I mean, it's a crazy world out there, isn't it? I mean, this is peak in Illinois. This is high security right here. I mean, it is, seriously. It is very seriously high security. You put something out in your front porch, and guess what? It's going to turn up missing. 
I mean, that's just that. I mean, you know, you got to lock everything up. You got to have everything under lock and key. I mean, you look at you look at the crime rate out here. I mean, how effective do you think it would be to knock on the doors at South Side of Pure and have somebody answer the door and share the crop and share the gospel with them? Mm. See, I could convince you that that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, I could probably convince you that maybe cell groups don't work. Mm -hmm. I could probably convince you maybe that maybe Bible studies don't work. Mm -hmm. I could probably convince you that inviting somebody over to your house for a barbecue is not effective anymore. You see, if I can get you looking, there might be somebody hungry. Somebody said, no, oh, no, that's good. You see, if I can get the body of Christ, if I was the devil, and I could get the body of Christ looking at the methods rather than the gospel, then I can terrorize you because I can convince you that door-to-door -door doesn't work. I can convince you that street missing doesn't work. I can convince you that cell groups don't work. I can convince you that the method is no longer effective in the day and hour we live. So all I got to do is shift the body of Christ's eyes onto the method mm. and off of the gospel. Mm. Mm. That's right. Let me share with you one of the greatest lies to ever rise up from the pit of hell. Okay. What used to work don't work no more. Mm. You hear that all the time, don't you? Oh, yes. So, let me, let me clarify this. Mm -hmm. For somebody to accept that means you're looking at the method and not the gospel. Right. Because we've already established that this scripture is true. Yes. Yesterday, today, and forever. There's never a time when that word isn't true. That's there's right. never a time when the gospel is not the power of God unto salvation. And what worked 100 years ago was the gospel. What worked 50 years ago was the gospel. What worked no matter what method you were using was the gospel. So what worked yesterday was the gospel. And what works today is the gospel. What will work tomorrow is the gospel. There never will be a time when the power of God is not inherently in the gospel. That's right. Amen. So what worked to work, used to work, works great today. Yes. Amen. It'll work great tomorrow. It'll work great yes. next Next month, it'll work great 10 years from now. The exactly. only thing that has ever worked is the gospel. Yes, amen. But the enemy has gotten our eyes mm -hmm. on methods. Yes. And says, that don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we have all of our list of things to do, and all of a sudden we've been convinced that none of those work. Mm -hmm. So here we sit mm -hmm. on our hands mm -hmm. with evangelism paralysis. Mm -hmm. I've heard pastors say, I don't know what to do. Nothing seems to work anymore. Excuse me, sir. Man, mm -hmm. the gospel works. Yes, the gospel works. Yes. It's the power of God yes. unto salvation. Yes. Hallelujah. But we get convinced that the methods don't work. Mm -hmm. And we're like the guy with the talent who goes and buries it in the ground. Yeah. With evangelism paralysis. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to come to church no more. What do we do? The things that used to work don't work no more. Mm -hmm. The gospel works. Yes, it does. And it always will. Yes, it will. It's not the method. Mm -hmm. It's the power of God. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit draws men to Jesus, doesn't it? Yes, that's right. Doesn't when Jesus was getting ready to leave, didn't he say it's expedient that I go? Because mm -hmm. then I'm going to send the comforter? Yes. And what's the comforter going to do? He's going to reprove men of sin and righteousness and judgment. That word reprove means he's going to convince men yes. of sin yes. and righteousness yes. and judgment. Hallelujah. But pastor, the things that used to work don't work anymore. The Holy Spirit's not effective anymore. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit can't persuade the hearts of people anymore. You see, if we say what used to work doesn't work, means we're looking at a method and not really looking at the gospel and realizing right. it was the power of the Holy Spirit that brought us to Jesus. Amen. It wasn't some method. Yeah. I wasn't drawn to Jesus Christ because somebody stood on the street corner and preached about the second coming of Christ. I was drawn to Jesus Christ because somebody stood on the street corner and preached about the second coming of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit came all over me yeah. and I never experienced yeah. anything like that in my life. I could never forget it. I'd go to sleep and I'd have dreams about it. I'd wake up and I'd think about it. The Spirit of the living God was drawing me to Jesus Christ yes. and persuading my heart. That still works. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Get excited here. Slow down. Slow down. Sin, mm. righteousness, and judgment. Yes. I always told people, that's Billy Graham's three-point sermon every time he preached. Mm -hmm. Man is a sinner. Yes. Righteousness is available to us to the atoning works of Jesus Christ. Yes. And we'll face judgment on whether or not we receive him. That's right. 
As a three-point servant, he preached everywhere he went. Some way, yes. shape, or form, that's what he preached. Yes. We're he perfectly in line with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit still exactly. persuades the hearts yes, he of men. Remember, in the book of Genesis it said that the earth was dark and without form. God looked at it and said, let there be light! <laughs> that's exactly what the Bible tells us happens. Yes. Our eyes are blinded by the God of this world. Yes. But the Holy Spirit speaks light into our heart and speaks to us our heart, and we see the glory of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's the Holy Spirit that breaks through and brings the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. It's not some method. Mm -hmm. Remember Peter, when he's Jesus, Jesus asked him and said, Peter, who do men say that I am? Well, you know, they had all kinds of brilliant ideas. John the Baptist and Jeremiah and Elijah, all these dead people. I mean, I don't know why you encourage them those people all dead. <laughs> you know, apparently they were, had a, I didn't, thought they were blaming the reincarnation or something, I'm not sure. But then Jesus knelt down and said, but Peter, who do you say that I am? Mm, yeah. He says, well, you're, you're, you're the Son of God. The Son of the living God, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Blessed art thou, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who art in heaven. Yes. The Holy Spirit yes. persuades yes. the heart of men. Yes. The Holy Spirit oh, reveals Jesus goodness. Christ. Yes. The Holy Spirit brings revelation yes, and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yes, he He's still effective in the time. Yes, amen. He's still effective in the day and the hour we live. Mm -hmm. Go to First Corinthians <laughs> chapter two. Shifting gears for just a second here. Because I want to refine this line of thought just a little bit. I can control myself. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. And I'm going to hop around the verses here a little bit. <clears throat> that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yes. The power of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Yes. See, we're focusing again on the power of God. Yes. Now, the wisdom of men could be all of those methods I just gave you. I mean, you could go out here, and I, I just spent a lot of my time over the years, and I was always drawn to evangelism, and, you know, I'd read this book and that book, and, you know, every book under the sun, and they had all the statistics and all the numbers and told you all the things that didn't work and the things that they thought would work, and I could have just taken that all in and could have been nothing more than the wisdom of men. I could have focused on their studies, and I could have focused on their... There are statistics and there are numbers, and I'm not saying that has no place, but you have to be careful with that. I mean, I, I've always, I, you know, my brain works a little odd. If you don't believe that, ask my wife after I'm done. She'll, she'll verify that. Um, I heard an amen back there. Um, but you imagine going out, you know, people going to these communities and they have these surveys about what kind of church to build. And I've always given my imagination, imagine them walking up to legions. And just ask him, say, sir, what's your name? They call me legions because we're many. Oh, okay. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? You know, if, if we was to build a church in your community, what, what would you like to see? What kind of church would you like it to be? Oh, I don't know. Probably potlucks with raw meat. I mean, I don't know what he would have wanted. I mean, you know, he say, well, you know, but are we done? I've got to get back to the cemetery and howl like an animal, cut myself up, and break some chains. In other words, the wisdom of men wouldn't have done much for him, would it? He needed the power of God. Yes, he did. He needed to be set free and delivered. Yes. He needed the gospel. Yes. Which is the power of God unto salvation. Yes. So we have to ask ourselves a question tonight. Do we have faith in the power of God uh, to reach the lost? Yes. Where's our faith at? It's easy to say hallelujah, yes. But I want to examine that just a little bit. Do we have faith in the power of God to reach the lost in our community? Because I know a lot of Christians who are pretty discouraged about that. I know a lot of pastors who are pretty discouraged about that. Could it be possible that we have gotten our eyes so much on methodology and methods and heard so much about what don't work anymore that our faith has truly shifted 
from the power of God to the methods that we're told don't work. I remember uh, King Asa. I, I use him as a lot of examples because for some reason that uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 16 is a chapter of God's word that the Lord has spoke to me so much out of. And 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord go to and fro in search of those whose heart is perfect toward him, that he might show himself strong on their behalf. And that word perfect toward him just means simply, if you looked at him, he would just simply trust him. That person who wholly and completely trusts God is the person that God is looking for, so that he might move mightily in their behalf. You see, King Asa had an issue and he never quite got it. He never came to realize what his problem was, apparently. King Asa was a man who had seen some really miraculous victories. And one day he had an idea. I'm going to take money out of the treasury of the house of God, and I'm going to use that to enter into covenant with Syria. And in that covenant, if somebody attacks me, Syria will protect me. And if God wasn't going to get enough of job. And if somebody attacks Syria, I'll help them. We'll be in covenant. In other words, this man who had seen great victories in the, in the, by the hand of God suddenly decided that he had to enter into covenant with the world. And we know what happened. That God sent him a prophet, didn't he? And the prophet came to him and said, you know, basically it's pretty simple. When you trusted God, you saw victories. When you entered into covenant with Syria, you saw defeat. You see, how could it be? Could that apply to evangelism? Well, we have treasures in the church that are used for evangelism. And I'm not saying this applies to you. Maybe it doesn't. But I want to show you a picture, too, overall of how the enemy is attacking the body of Christ in regards to evangelism. He's, he's convinced and intimidated many people to lay down the treasures that we have. <laughs> what are you talking about treasures? We have the Word of God. Yes. You see, there's many attacks on the Word of God in our time, many attacks on the Word of God in our society. The, you know, the entertainment field tries to mock Christians if we're some kind of buffoons for believing God's Word. There's all kinds of intimidating political forces trying to get us to lay down biblical truth. You see, in many churches... They've kind of laid this treasure up, haven't they? Yeah. They've kind of closed it and put it on a shelf. Because somebody came along and convinced them that the word of God in somehow or another is outdated and offensive. So they've kind of then entered into covenant with Syria. They said, I'll tell you what, world, I'll lay up the Bible if you guys will come to my church. That's a covenant with the world. That's entering strictly into covenant with the world, isn't it? Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Some people said, you know, if you guys do the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our services, I I'm going to bring my first cousin. You're going to offend him. Mm -hmm. Or my second cousin, or, or whomever. Oh. And many churches have said, you know, maybe he's right. It's okay to do the spiritual gifts, but we'd like you to do those at home in your prayer closet. Maybe do them in a, in a cell group or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now that we want to enter into covenant with the world, if we, if we stop manifesting the gifts, mm -hmm. will you come? We can go on down the line. <laughs> Praying for the sick. Casting out devils. Many churches would say, well, you would just pretend like there's really nothing to all of that because we don't want to freak out the people who come to church. Mm -hmm. We'll enter into a covenant with the world. Mm -hmm. We won't do that if you'll come. Mm -hmm. Moving of the Holy Spirit. Well, that, that, that just seems odd. That seems kind of can't. People, people don't know how to understand that. We just, we'll, we'll just have to kind of keep that under control and keep that under wraps, and then we'll enter covenant with the world, and then they'll come. You see, beloved, what, I, what I'm telling you is, it, 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 if you've been in the body of Christ for any period of time, you understand that that's areas where the body of Christ is being tremendously attacked at the day and the hour we live. That's right, amen. We're being attacked to lay up our treasures and enter into covenant with the world and do things their way because we think if we do things their way, they will come to our church. I, uh, I was praying this afternoon and as 
as I was praying, I, uh, I, I just, it was the Spirit of God just came over me. And uh, as he did that, I, I just, I seen something in my, in my spirit. It was just <clears throat> like a, a soldier walking into battle without any weaponry. And it was just psh, plastered. And they're trying to crawl away. And you see, beloved, that's what the church is like when we lay up our treasures. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against right. principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in mm -hmm. high places. Mm -hmm. And if we lay up our treasures, that's right. we, we walk defenseless in the battle. Yes. God sent that prophet, and Asa still didn't get it. He cast him in prison. And a little bit later, Asa had a, a foot disease, and he died of that because it says he didn't seek God. You see, Asa was a man who, who seen so much. And yet, tried to do things the world's way. That's what happens if the church lays up their treasures. That's, right. That's what happens if we, if we allow those things to be taken from us in regards to evangelism. Most of us here are familiar with Gideon. Remember Gideon? I still, I, 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 I get a kick out of that account. And we know he was getting ready to go into battle, and I think, what was he, he had uh, 22,000 soldiers. That's a pretty good group. God showed up and says, you know what? That's too many, because if you guys go into battle and I give you the victory, you're going to think you did it. So I want you to tell all those guys that are afraid they can go home. Now, that's a good way to start a battle, isn't it? Hey, any of you guys that want to go home, they go ahead and go home. Just go home, see your eyes, we'll fight this. Well, a good bunch of them cleared out, didn't they? Yes. I think he had, what, about 10,000 left then. Yeah. He's probably thinking, Phew. The guy says, that's too many. Yes. He says, I want you to go and have them go down there and, and, and get a drink out of the pond over there. And those who take the water and lap it, some will get down on their knees and drink it. If I remember right, those who took the water and lapped it were the ones that he got to keep. He went from 22,000 to 300. God says, now we're ready to fight. <laughs> you see, what was God doing there? God wasn't trying to take power away from him. He was trying to get him in position for empowerment. He was trying to get him in a place where he laid down the world's resources. He laid down the world's strength. He laid down the world's might. And he received the power of Almighty God to walk in and see the victory. And I believe with all of my heart, one of the things that's happening in the body of Christ is we're kind of going through a Gideon season. And God said, you know what? Look at my treasures. Look at my word. Look at my gospel. Look at the power of my spirit. And that's what you walk into the battle with. And he's trying to get us to lay down all the other stuff and get, leave things behind us that don't need to be there to bring yes. us to a position of empowerment for the greatest revival this planet has ever seen. But we've got to be in place to be empowered by Almighty God and have our faith in the right place. Yes, that's right. Amen. We've got to strip away everything else. Yes, we do. We've got to break covenant with the world. Yes. And say, I'm standing on your word, God. I'm standing in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm standing on the gospel. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And I'm not ashamed of it. And I'm going to proclaim it in the power of the Holy Ghost, no matter what comes my way. Yes. That's why God is looking for a people to empower. Amen. Not somebody to use the world's resources and devices. <clears throat> Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, glory. First, I could get excited, couldn't you? Yes. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 2. Let's go back there. I'm about to run out of time. I'm trying hard. We have to look what time I started. I think about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Rob threatened last night to take all of my Sweet time. Word. Be not to deceive, God shall not be mocked. As a man soweth, thus shall he reap. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Hallelujah. Yes. See, I think this is what Paul is doing here. He's in a Gideon time. He's in a Gideon time in Corinth. I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ, and yes. him crucified. Hallelujah. Lay down all your devices. Yes. Lay down all your programs. Thank you, Jesus. Lay down all your methods. Mm. We're going to look to Jesus. Yes, we are. You see, oh, 
I, Joe asked me the title, and I gave him some long two or three sentences. But I said, the focus and the fire. Mm. When we get our focus right, That's right, then comes the fire. Hallelujah. Remember Elijah, <coughs> prophets of Baal? They called them in. They had this big prophet war. They called in all the prophets of Baal and said, you know, we're going to call upon God, and the God that answers by fire is the one true God. And the prophets of Baal get out there, and, you know, they cut themselves up and howl and do all their stuff they do. And Elijah, like I've always said, is one of my favorite prophets. He stands by the side and just trash talks them. I love yeah. that. You know, what's wrong? Your God is sweet? Where's he at? Maybe he's sick. Where's your God at? <laughs> just kind of taunts them. And after they're all done, you know what Elijah did next? He got the focus right. Yes, he did. He went and built an altar. Mm -hmm. First thing he did. After he built the altar, altar, then he prayed. God showed him that I did this at your word. And then came the fire. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing right here. He's building the altar in the church at Corinth. He said, let's get this right. I'm determined to know nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. Yes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto yes. salvation. Hallelujah. When we get our focus right and forget what the devil's told us about That's the method right. and forget what the devil said don't work and get our eyes on what we know does work, yes. the power of Almighty God and the atoning works of Jesus Christ, and we begin to proclaim that to this world under the yes. anointing and the power yes. of the Holy Spirit, beloved, then the fire comes Amen. down. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise uh, Hallelujah. Thank you. Verse 4. I'll finish it up here real quick, I promise. Okay. <laughs> hallelujah. I don't know what time it is. Oh, what time. <laughs> and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, yes. but in demonstration mm. of the Spirit and of power. Yes. <clears throat> Where's our faith at? Have we locked into methods and had the devil tell us they don't work? And set on our hands in evangelism paralysis? What if, I, I just, I just a little thought here. What if, I mean, say if I told you, if somehow or another, I see the future for tomorrow. And I said, Vince, we'll pick up Vince, since he's on front row. <laughs> and I said, Vince, if you go out and knock on ten doors tomorrow, I guarantee you that somebody's going to come to Christ, they're going to come to church, they're going to get filled in the Holy Spirit, they're going to learn the Word of God and walk out in victory for the rest of their life. How do you think Vince would knock on ten doors? Probably would, wouldn't he? Yeah. Now, if we just said, Vince, let's go knock on the door and tell people about Jesus without that promise, if I think, eh, maybe not. <laughs> See, the reason I use that illustration is because it really is a matter of whether or not we think it's efficient. It's really a matter of whether we think it will work. Yes. Yeah. Can I share something with you? I don't know the future, but I can guarantee you the gospel works. That's right. Amen. I can guarantee you the gospel works. Yes, that's right. It's a power of God unto salvation. Amen. Some shall fall on good, fall on good ground. <coughs> I will guarantee you by the, on the basis of yes, God's word that the gospel works. Yes. And the day and hour we live. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration yes. of the Spirit and of power. That word demonstration here is kind of interesting. I, I, I did a couple studies on it. I thought, you know, it's a pointing of, a proof, a showing forth, or display by the operation of the Spirit of God, affecting hearts and lives of the hearers. The Amplified says it's proof by the spirit and powers of God operating in me and stirring in the minds of my hearers the most holy emotions, thus persuading them. Mm, yes. The Holy Spirit persuades the hearts of men and women yes, he of the gospel. Yes. He still is. Yes, he is. He's still powerful. Hallelujah, amen. He's still sufficient. Yes, One last scenario. Imagine you're praying for somebody. Neighbor. And God just puts it on your heart to begin to pray for that neighbor. As you begin to pray for them and, and, and you know God's answering your prayers, and maybe you don't see any great, you know, visible things, but God's working on their heart. One day you just go and you know, 
I, I, I just, you know, like to invite you to our church. Would you want to go to church with me? They think, you know, it sounds kind of awkward, but God's been working on their heart and drawing them. They will. Okay, I guess I will. And they go to church and walk into services and they're feeling kind of awkward. You know, the praise and worship band gets up there, people hoop and holler and all that stuff. And they're kind of feeling a little nervous about it, a little antsy about it, kind of doing this stuff. But the Spirit of God is talking to their hearts. Right. They're, they're, they're feeling something. They've never quite felt a presence like this before. For some reason, they just start to feel kind of emotional. Maybe they want to cry a little bit or laugh or Something's happening in their heart and they don't really quite understand it. Then maybe something really wild happens and somebody, you know, brings forth the gift of the Spirit. Well, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that sometimes he makes the hearts of men manifest when they realize God's in you. Then somebody gets up and preaches a sermon. And then 1 Corinthians 1 21 says the foolishness of preaching shall save men. And they hear the word of God and the spirit of God's been working in their hearts since she started praying for them. The spirit of God began to move as they entered it, as they were in that worship service. The spirit of God began to lay open their heart with the gifts of the spirit. And now they hear the word of God and that preacher gives an altar call and the spirit of God brings in the harvest. Now that sounds real simple, doesn't it? No raising of the dead or anything else. I just described to you the process that 73% of the people who come to Christ, how they came. Somebody they knew Invited them to church. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit of God persuaded their heart to accept Jesus Christ. Yes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's the power of God unto salvation. Yes. And I stand before you tonight and I guarantee you that the gospel works. Yes, it does. And anytime the devil tells you something don't work, mm -hmm. he's lying. Liar. Amen? Amen? The gospel works. Man. I was taking your word. I'm texting for all these. My last one. This is a promise. This is the last one. <laughs> Pastor Bob's going to shut me down if this ain't the last one. <laughs> you know, we, we hear a lot. We talk a lot. And, and, you know, faith people do about, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Mm -hmm. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I think we may need to hear a little bit, maybe we need to hear about the power of the gospel again. Yeah. Maybe we need some fresh yeah. rhema there. Yeah. Amen? Amen. The power of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah. I'm done, I promise. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah.